Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. A couple months ago, the United States experienced its first total solar eclipse in over 20 years. All my science YouTube friends had a field day and made some awesome videos, but here at 12 Tone, we felt a little left out. There just wasn't anything for a music theorist to say, but today, that changes. Today, we're talking about our own total eclipse, not of the sun, but of the heart. Hey, better late than never, right? The verse starts like this. And the first thing we need to figure out is the chords. These are what's called arpeggios, where the notes of the chord are played one at a time instead of all at once, and they've got a couple extra notes added in to give it a more melodic feel, but overall, I think it's safe to say that the harmony here is just going back and forth between B minor and A major. This section doesn't have a very strong sense of tonality, which makes it hard to nail down the key, but since the intro before it is just a couple more bars of B minor, I think that's probably the best guess. That means we're alternating between the 1 minor and the flat 7 chord, but it's worth noting that both these chords can also be found in the key of A major as the 2 minor and the 1. That'll come up again later. After it plays that a couple times, we hear this. which we can reduce to D major and C major. There's a couple things going on here. First of all, the keys of B minor and D major have what's called a relative relationship, which means they contain all the same notes, they just use them differently. This makes changing between them really smooth, and I think that's what's happening here. We've left the darker, sadder minor for a slightly more uplifting section in a major key. The C major, then, is the flat 7 chord, which gives us the same 1 to flat 7 structure we saw in the first half. It's a little bit weirder here, because major isn't supposed to have a flat 7 chord, but we're just borrowing it in order to keep the same sound. The other important point here actually occurs before this part begins. Earlier on, we were ending our progression with an A major. We called that the flat 7 chord in B minor, and it is, but in the key of D major, it becomes something else, the 5 chord. This has what's called dominant function, meaning it points you back to the root, so ending our previous progression with it kind of foreshadows the change to the new key. Changing keys by using a chord in two different ways at the same time is called a pivot chord modulation, and it sounds really smooth. Combine that with the relative relationship the keys share, and it's no wonder this key change is almost completely hidden. Anyway, back to our D major section, that one ends in C major, which in addition to being the flat 7 chord there, is also the 5 chord in the key of F major. And wouldn't you know it, that's where we go next. This is the turnaround bright eyes section, and they just stick on the 1 chord the entire time. Well, at least the piano does, but the bass actually slides up to a B flat for some of it. This creates an interesting tension where the bass is implying a different harmony from what the rest of the band is playing. It wants to move, but the piano is refusing to budge. After that, we go back to the beginning. It's a big dramatic transition emphasized by a huge percussion hit, but more importantly driven by the harmony. We're going from F major to B minor, and if that sounded weird to you, that's because it is. The roots of these chords are a tritone apart, and tritones are really unstable. This makes the whole thing feel dark and unsettled, which accents the shift back to minor. We play through that whole thing again, but at the end, instead Instead of repeating, we move into the chorus. and suddenly everything changes. Where before we had a bunch of tonal ambiguity making it hard to nail down the key, this section spells it out perfectly with one of the most famous chord progressions of all time. It's often called the doo-wop changes, and it gives us a pretty surprising answer. We're in A major, the key we thought we might have been in at the very beginning. We can tell because this section exemplifies what's called functional harmony, which is the idea that different chords in a key have different functions or jobs to do. We start with the one chord, then the six minor. These both have tonic function, meaning they're at rest. Next, we move to the 4 chord, which has subdominant function, introducing some instability in order to set up the next chord, the 5 chord, which has dominant function. We talked about this one earlier, its job is to point you back home. We play through that a couple times to really establish the sound of the key, and then we move into the bridge, which is pretty long and never actually repeats itself, so I'll break it up into subsections. First we have this one. And these chords are pretty familiar. We've got the 4 chord again, then the 5 chord, which should point us back to 1, but instead we go to 6 minor. That's fine though, it's still tonic function. Going from 5 to 6 minor is often called a deceptive resolution, because it's almost like going back to the 1 chord, but slightly different. The bass is also doing something cool. It's not playing the root like we'd expect. For the first two chords at least, it's playing the 3rd degree instead. This creates what's called an inversion, where the lowest note in the chord isn't the root, which dampens a bit of that chord's harmonic strength. It adds a little complexity, but it doesn't fundamentally change the chord's character. The only really weird thing is this B major, but I'll come back to that in a minute. First, let's look at the next section. Here 
Here we have the 1 chord, then the 5 chord, which is again in an inversion, then another deceptive resolution to the 6 minor, and then that B major again. Alright, let's talk about it. The first thing that stands out to me is that it always seems to be set up by an F sharp minor chord. This makes it look like a device called a 2-5 where we borrow chords from another key in order to set up a resolution to that key's root. Specifically, as the name implies, we borrow the 2 chord and the 5 chord. In this case, these two chords would imply a resolution to E major, but we don't actually see that. Both times, it winds up going back to A major instead. So while it does invoke the sound of a 2-5, it doesn't really act like one. But I have another explanation. It's not borrowed from a different key, it's borrowed from a different scale. Specifically, it's borrowed from Lydian which is like major, but with a raised fourth degree. This gives it a floating dreamlike quality and conveniently a major two chord. We're still in the key of A, we're just dipping our toes into a slightly different modality. Finally, we have this section. which is, again, pretty straightforward. We've got the 1 chord again, with a brief visit from the 5 chord here, then back to 1, to 4, to 5, and then we resolve to 1 into the breakdown. Again, we see really strong functional harmony, with chords behaving exactly the way we expect them to. Still, though, it's interesting to me that they approach this section in three different ways. They're all expressing the same harmonic ideas, but each one does it a little differently. This technique of not repeating parts is called through composition, and while it's generally applied to whole songs, not just sections, I think it's interesting to see it alluded to here. The constant change helps build up energy which prepares the listener for the final climax. That climax drops us into the breakdown, a much quieter section that sounds something like this. And the harmony is, again, pretty functional. In fact, it looks a lot like the doo-wop changes from earlier. We start on the 1 chord, then go to 6 minor, before transitioning to C-sharp major. This is a little tricky to explain, but I think it's best viewed as a secondary dominant that wants to resolve back to F-sharp minor. Instead, we get another deceptive resolution to D, the 4, then we hit this chord, the 2 minor 7. This is actually a substitution for the 4 chord. If we look at the notes of B minor 7, we see the notes of D major inside it. Then we go to the 5 chord, which again has dominant function, and points us back to the 1. We wrap it up with this section, where we play those doo-wop changes again, but with a cool melody in the piano to fill some space. And that's pretty much it. Well, actually, there's a couple other cool things I wanted to talk about that I couldn't even fit into the script. I'll be honest, I was really surprised by this song. I mean, it's a pop ballad, how hard could it be to analyze? And while it certainly makes use of a lot of common tools, it uses them in really clever ways. Working on this has given me a lot of respect for the composer, Jim Steinman, and his ability to do brilliant things with basic chords. I had no idea how complicated this song was, but somehow this video wound up longer than the one I did on Stairway to Heaven, so that probably tells you something. Anyway, thanks for watching, and thanks to Patreon patron Malin Dirks for suggesting this song. If you'd like to see your favorite song analyzed, just head on over to Patreon and pledge at any level. You can also check out our store, join our mailing list, like, share, comment, subscribe, and keep on rocking.